I'm a social psychologist, a feminist, and a sex researcher, not necessarily in that order. And in my line of work, I encounter a lot of myths about sex. Today, I'll be addressing three myths that I interrogate in my research. The first myth is that women naturally dislike casual sex. And this myth is based on the assumption that there's something in women's biological or genetic makeup that's a barrier to them being able to enjoy sex without strings attached. Generally, the reasoning goes, women have a biological need to bond with others. And so they just can't stand the tawdry practice of base, primal, unattached sex. Yet, in my research, the strongest predictor of whether people, male or female, will accept a particular casual sex offer is whether they think the proposer will be a good lover. So in essence, Women want good lovers in a casual sex encounter, but they don't think the sex will be good. And sadly, at least in the college context, women aren't having particularly good heterosexual casual sex. <sighs> Let's consider a comment by a college male in a study by Armstrong and colleagues. He said, in a hookup, I don't give a shit about whether a woman orgasms. And this was not an uncommon sentiment in Armstrong's studies. So women have good reason to suspect that if they have casual sex with men, it might not work out well for them. A second big reason why people, again, males and females alike, are inclined to make a decision about casual sex is whether they think they'll be stigmatized for engaging in it. So in essence, women want respect out of a casual sex encounter, but they think that they'll be called sluts. And indeed, surprise, surprise, women are stigmatized more than men for engaging in casual sex. And bizarrely, the very men who are so desperately craving casual sex are the same ones who are disparaging women for engaging in it, for example, by calling them sluts. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, let's talk to these guys. Okay, guys, let me get this straight. You want women to hook up with you. You don't care if they find it pleasurable. And you're going to call them sluts afterwards. <laughs> and you wonder why women don't want to have sex with you? I think we can all agree that women's lack of interest in having sex with men like this has nothing to do or nothing about some mysterious difference between women's and men's brains. It's about the fact that women do indeed have brains. <laughs> Because no one, male or female, would accept a casual sex offer if they knew that bad sex and public humiliation were the terms of the encounter. And it's telling that in my research, when we control for these two factors, the sense that you'll be stigmatized for engaging in casual sex and the sense that the sex might not be good, gender differences in casual sex disappear often. So it seems to me we should be thinking a lot about social and cultural factors before we turn to biological or genetic explanations for gender differences in casual sex. So far, I've been talking about heterosexual encounters, but what about lesbians and gay men? So according to cultural perceptions, who likes casual sex more, lesbians or gay men? Most people would say, both lay people and the general public and also researchers, that it's gay men who are the ones who are always up for casual sex. So we did a study in which we asked lesbians and gay men to imagine that someone randomly on the street came up to them and said, do you want to have sex with me? We asked how they would respond to the offer. Despite these cultural perceptions, we found no differences in how lesbians and gay men would respond to someone just coming up to them randomly on the street. And indeed, we've done a number of studies with lesbians and gay men where we ask about their past offers of casual sex and whether they accepted them or not. And very often, we can't find these expected gender differences. Now, what about people who are attracted to members of both genders? We did one study with bisexual women, 
and we ask them to imagine that either a woman or a man proposed casual sex to them, and they were much more likely to accept the offer from the woman than from the man. And then a study with both bisexual women and men, we found no gender, we only found gender differences when a male was making the proposal. So when it was a guy proposer, the bisexual men were more likely to accept the offer than the bisexual women, but when it was a female proposer, there were no differences. Perhaps we can conclude from these data that it's not something in women's biology that prevents them from enjoying casual sex. The problem is that males are less appealing casual sex proposers than women are. <laughs> so let's move on now from a casual context to a committed context and myth two. And this is the myth that monogamy is the best relationship style for everyone in every context, hands down. And I found in my research that people ascribe a variety of positive traits to people who are in monogamous relationships in comparison to consensually non-monogamous relationships. And I say consensually non-monogamous relationships, I'm referring to people who are swingers, or people who are in open relationships, or people who are polyamorous. These are people who've decided that it's acceptable for their partners to have romantic and sexual relationships with others. Participants in our studies believe that monogamous people have better romantic relationships and that they're less likely to get STIs. So we were curious about how far this bias in favor of monogamy would go, so we added some questions that don't have anything at all to do with monogamy. And in a comical turn, we found that monogamous people are also perceived as better dog walkers <laughs> and more responsible about taking daily vitamins. I'll leave the task of discerning dog walking skills to the Humane Society, but I will talk more about two of the other dimensions on which monogamy is perceived as superior. The first, I'll call this submyth A, is the idea that monogamy yields fewer STIs. And the assumption is that monogamous people are doing everything right. They're staying with one person, they're taking care of their health, they might be a little bored, but they're definitely safe. <laughs> and it is true that monogamy, if perfectly implemented, would stop the spread of STIs really quickly. But we still have STIs. And this may come as a surprise to some of you, but monogamy at some times fails. And I've actually found that about a third of the people in my studies who say they're monogamous have actually had sex with someone else since that relationship started. That, of course, would mean that an even higher percentage of monogamous couples are affected by incidents of cheating. So we conduct a study in which we compared consensually non-monogamous people to people who were cheating on their partners, and I will indelicately, with apologies, refer to them as cheaters. We asked the cheaters and the consensually non-monogamous people to tell us about the most recent time they had had a sexual encounter with someone outside of their primary romantic dyad. So their most recent extra-dyadic encounter, and we asked them about safer sex during that encounter. The consensually non-monogamous people were significantly more likely to have discussed STI history prior to the encounter than the cheaters. They were also significantly more likely to have used condoms during the extra diet encounter than cheaters. And bless their hearts, the consensually non-monogamous people were significantly more likely to have covered or sterilized their sex toys if they used them during the encounter than cheaters. So, in essence, Consensually non-monogamous people are having better safer sex than people who are cheating on their partners. And of course, better safer sex will lead to fewer STIs, not more. So the next myth I'll talk about is that monogamous people have better relationships. To test this hypothesis, we compared consensually non-monogamous and monogamous people on a variety of measures related to their relationship. 
Did we find that monogamous people were these glowing beacons of relational adjustment? Let's see. We found no differences between monogamous and consensually non-monogamous people on their commitment to the relationship. We found no differences in passionate love for their partner. We found no differences in relationship satisfaction. And we found no differences in trust for their partner. Now, people can and do reap generous rewards from monogamous relationships, of course. But what I'm not seeing is evidence that monogamy is overwhelmingly superior to other non-monogamous relationship configurations. And that brings me to myth three. I have the sense <laughs> that people are irrational about sex, and especially about STIs. So in this last myth, I fuse the twin ideas that sex is immoral or that people who have sex are bad, and that sex is just really incredibly dangerous for you. We tested these ideas in a number of ways. In one study, we simply asked people to estimate the number of people they would expect to die driving once from Detroit to Chicago or by contracting HIV through having one instance of unprotected intercourse. Now, keep in mind, it is about 20 times more likely that you would die driving the Detroit to Chicago stretch than that you would contract HIV from one instance of unprotected intercourse. But yet, participants in our study were convinced that it was 17 times more likely <laughs> that you would contract HIV from having unprotected sex once than you would die driving from Detroit to Chicago. So in another study, we examined the messages that we receive from organizations that regulate public health and safety. Specifically, we looked at Department of Motor Vehicle websites and public health websites for each state. Now, recall with me that driving is a far riskier activity than sex. But none of the DMV websites mentioned that the best way to avoid getting into a car accident is to stay out of a car. <laughs> Yet this is undeniably true. The best way to avoid dying in a car accident is to abstain from driving. They didn't mention this, but 72% of the public health websites mentioned that the best way to avoid getting an STI is to abstain from sex entirely. But sex is so much less dangerous than driving. Shouldn't we be exhorting people to stay out of a car if they at all can, right? When I think about this study, I'm inclined to think about parents of adolescents. American parents are excessively, by my estimation, concerned about preventing their adolescents from having sex. And if you ask them why, they'll say, well, it's not safe for them to be having sex. But yet, what really is the worst thing that can happen from deciding to have sex? We all know that pregnancy can be easily prevented. And HIV is really serious, and people should take it seriously, but it can also be stopped by using a condom. And in this day and age, if you contract HIV, it's a manageable health concern. It's not a death sentence. By contrast, car accidents are the leading cause of death among adolescents. So if parents were purely concerned about their adolescent safety, and if they were being rational about that concern, they would spend more time keeping the kids out of cars and less time keeping them out of each other's pants. <laughs> I have one more set of studies to talk to you about. In these studies, we had people read one of two stories. In both stories, the protagonists were going through a bad breakup with a partner. In both stories, the protagonists had some medical symptoms that they brushed off as nothing, which turned out to be an infection. And in both stories, the protagonist had sex with someone they just met at a party. The key difference between the two stories? In story one, 
the protagonist transmitted the serious form of flu, H1N1, to their partner during sex. In story two, the protagonist transmitted the mild STI, chlamydia, to their partner during sex. The person who unwittingly transmitted chlamydia to the partner was perceived as more risky, more selfish, and dumber than the one who unwittingly transmitted H1N1. So in the next study, we varied the outcomes for the partner, the protagonist in our story. This time, in story one, the protagonist transmitted chlamydia to the partner, and that partner had a very mild outcome. The partner just had to take antibiotics for a couple weeks. In the other version of the story, the protagonist transmitted H1N1 to the partner, and the partner had the most dire possible outcome. The partner died in that version of the story. Now, you might think that the protagonist who transmitted H1N1 to the partner and caused them to die would be perceived more negatively than the partner who transmitted chlamydia to someone and just caused them to have to take antibiotics for a couple weeks, right? Wrong. The person who transmitted chlamydia and caused their partner to need antibiotics was perceived as more risky, more selfish, and dumber than a person who transmitted H1N1 and caused their partner to die. It's apparently better to kill someone than to give them an STI. So when I think about on this side of data, it seems to me that sex is not just stigmatized, but stigmatized irrationally, so that we believe that it's immoral and dangerous. And that means that if you have sex and something bad happens to you, we as a society can say, you got what you deserved. Then I'd like to think about these three myths overall, and I think one of the things that they convey is that it's best for people not to have sex. People who transmit STIs are evil. Women who have casual sex are sluts and don't deserve pleasure. And people who have more than one romantic relationship at the same time can't be trusted even to walk a dog. <laughs> In sum, sex is an unnecessary human indulgence, best avoided by morally good people. But yet, sex has all kinds of positive outcomes. In addition to the obvious. Sex has been shown to bolster your immune system, increase blood pressure re reactivity, and relieve migraines. So if you have sex, be as safe as you can, and then put all the crazy warnings and stereotypes behind you. Don't feel guilty about feeling good about sex. Thank you.